This is The Daily Space for today, Friday, March 27th, 2020. I'm your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. In this modern world, we all find ourselves periodically wondering, is there a world out there I can escape to, or can I shoot this other person off into space? Well, while you may not care if that space is all that habitable in the second case, finding a place capable of supporting life may matter more if it's yourself you'd like to take somewhere else. The good folks at Cornell have your back. A team led by Lisa Kadenegger has looked at the geologic and biologic history of our own mostly habitable planet and defined five key points in our world's evolution. Using advanced computer models, they've defined how our world would look to distant observers during each of these periods in time. Specifically, they've defined our planet's changing chemical barcode, that rainbow of light with superimposed dark lines that marks out the colors of different elements that are getting absorbed as sunlight passes through our Earth's atmosphere. These kinds of spectral signatures won't be unique to our Earth. This paper doesn't just explain how our world might look to aliens. It also explains how alien worlds could look to us. In their paper, this research team looks at how our Earth would look currently, as well as 3.9, 3.5, 1 to 2, and 0.5 to 0.8 billion years ago. These specific periods correspond to our Earth in its prebiotic days when the atmosphere was dominated by carbon dioxide, to the Archaean period when continents had just finished forming and life was just starting, to the Paleo or Mesoproterozoic period when oxygen began to rise in our atmosphere thanks to life. And finally, to that time when multicellular life began to dominate our world in the Neoproterozoic period. While the model for today reflects the impacts of intelligence and the pollution that comes with industry, the early epochs show distinct changes that come from the presence of different kinds of life. By taking into consideration the changes in planetary temperature, chemistry, and the biosignatures of life, they've provided observers with detailed charts of what we may someday see when we look at the atmospheres of distant worlds. One of the greatest sadnesses of this paper is that the JWST will have the capacity to measure the atmospheres of planets outside our solar system. If it had launched in 2011 as planned, this team could be going through its archive to say, this world matches the age of the dinosaurs and that one, well, it may have its first single-celled critters. But at this stage, I have no idea when JWST might launch And I don't think anyone has an idea when it will launch. So for now, and this is cool research with absolutely no application. Anyways, anyways, moving on to the next story. In our second story of the day, we have a pretty picture from the Atacama Large Millimeter Array that introduces us to the active galaxy MGJ 0414 plus 0534. And this pretty picture is one in which astronomers have caught a supermassive galaxy in the distant universe just starting to turn on and form jets. Now, in the past, we've caught galaxies in the act of turning off their jets. Hanny's Vorverp, the the light echo of a now-dead quasar that one of you has, well, named yourself after. Hanny's Vorverp was the first example of this class of object to be found. Finding one just turning on? Well, this is new. And you're going to see a lot of headlines that say black hole ejects young jets. And once again, I'm going to remind you, black holes eject nothing. Black holes 
are strictly consumers. It's the accretion disk of material around that distant supermassive black hole that has just turned on and has just started to spew matter out into space, creating this rather weird looking because it's submillimeter, this rather weird looking amazing image. This research comes to us from the National Optical Astronomy uh, Facility of Japan, and it is published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. We look forward to seeing all the new models that are going to come as people work to understand how is it that these things turn on, how do they evolve, and how eventually do they turn off. This is one new observation that helps us, well, constrain that puzzle. And that's all I've got for today. It's a kind of slow news day. On Monday, we're going to be doing a deep dive into dark matter and all the new information we have coming out on this basically, well, refusing to be seen major constituent of our universe. Until then, I'd like to remind you once again that as part of helping keep all of us occupied in these really weird times, we here at CosmoQuest are going to be hosting a lot of additional content on our Twitch channel. And we want to remind you that CosmoQuest has an active community on Discord where you can talk science and, well, even find other people to join you in playing an online game. You can find links to everything that is going on at CosmoQuest.org. Thank you all for listening. Today's script was written by me, Dr. Pamela Gay. And The Daily Space is produced by Susie Murph. The Daily Space is a product of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system and beyond. We are here thanks to the generous contributions of people like you. The best way you can support us is through patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. Like us? Share us. You never know whose life you can change by adding a daily dose of science. <laughs> Thank you so much, K. Barat. Thank you so much. I will get the doggo cam back up. Hello, doggo cam. I'm behind the doggo cam. All right. <gasps> Look at that dog trying to steal souls. Are you ready? Are you ready? There you go. <laughs> I love the way Stella's like, I'm not going to get up. I am just going to lie here. <laughs> Thank you. Hold on. I'm trying to get dog cam off of me. Um, uh, let's hit that. There we go. <gasps> Do you guys want more? Malachi, sit. 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 Eddie knows how to sit. Malachi knows how to sit. Stella. Stella, Stella, sit. Okay, there we go. They're learning. Thank you, thank you. All right, so let's see what questions, what questions we have. Yes, <laughs> bad band. I totally get it, totally get it. <laughs> um, they are adorable. So, um, not gonna lie, we had one of those storms last night that you sometimes get here in the Midwest, where you wake up to lightning thunder and what sounds like rotten apples hitting the roof because of hail. And apparently Stella got so far under the bed that my six foot four long armed husband was unable to reach her. Eddie, on the other hand, had me thoroughly trapped and would simply look over his shoulder to make sure I was still there occasionally. So, yeah, <laughs> Eddie is participating in vits today. Um, so <laughs> I appreciate the random Bohemian Rhapsody in chat. I do. I really, really do. Um, slash 4D, I never meet your gods. They will make you disappointed. All right, scrolling backwards. Let's see what all we have going on. Um, 
Oh, hello, fellow sleepy hoodlum. I love you, sleepy. Sleepy. I think they're hedgehogs in your emote. Thank you again, Fenmel, for the sub. Um, Broken Symmetry has a new star emote. It is an excellent new star emote. Um, thank you, JB McCool, again. Thank you. I'm just going to throw more bits because sit. Sit. You can sit. <gasps> thank you. Sit. Can you sit? Can you ignore me completely? Sit. Come on, sit. Oh, forget it. They just get treats. They just get treats. Thank you. All right. It is a doggo swarm. Hello, Michael T. Mayer. Hello. Um, scrolling. I am on my second cup, not my second pot of coffee. You can totally have too much blue cheese on anything. You can have too much blue cheese on blue cheese, I think. Um, scrolling. Yeah, Kevlar, it is a long wait. And I think Michael T. Meyer has it correct. It's the Just Wait Space Telescope. Oh, you see, George, you're right. The delay is just... <laughs> Astro-wise, I... <laughs> needs a new command. We don't know when it will launch. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Oh, just waiting and waiting and waiting. Yes. So sad. Um... Uh, Astrowise asks, Hanny's Vorverp's colors or temperatures, red and green? Um, it's a combination of uh, temperatures and elements. Different elements gr glow different colors at different temperatures. So when you see certain colors, you know what's there and you know what temperature it is. This is one of the more awesome random things about how gases work. Um, let's see. Thank you, K. Brut, for the sub. Thank you. Thank you, Kevlar. We will have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for the bits. You can't see the dog cam. Now you can definitely see the dog cam. Whoa, hi. Hi. Sneaking up on me from behind. There. You. Why did you do that? Sneaker. He is a sneaky, sneaky boy. All right. Let's scroll. Um, I'm working really hard to try and get Malachi willing to hop up in that chair. Fenmil, you and your Eunice Snowman are excellent. James Knapper, I had no idea a space channel like this existed. It would have come in very, very handy when I was doing a little art project on Apollo 8 and Earthrise. Well, now you know. And redo things? I don't know what to suggest. Next art project, we're here for you. And um, I'm also a space artist. Um, I don't do space art on this channel. I do it on my personal channel, Star Strider with a Y. And um, if you check out 739 Studios, um, I, I do paintings of planets. They're not great, but they're mine. And sometimes that's enough. I want to see your artwork. Our Discord, we actually have a space art channel, and you should go in and share. We support art wherever we can. <sighs> Let's see what is in here. So much sadness about going to Mars. So much sadness. Um, getting to the Andromeda galaxy definitely requires stasis technology. 
because it's a long, slow journey, a very long, slow journey. Um, let's see. So it's the one says, do you think 5G radiation may be dangerous to humans or is there no scientific proof? There's no scientific proof for that. The only way that we know that it's dangerous to humans is it makes weather forecasting harder, which means that sometimes we may not know there's dangerous weather coming because the 5G made it hard to measure the weather stuff. So it's, inter it's interfering with different kinds of measurements we make of, at of the atmosphere. I don't remember because mornings exactly which part it's interfering with. Someone else on the channel might remember. Um, so we're fine bodily from 5G. In general, don't put your electronics next to parts of your body you like because radiation shielding can be an issue. Um, microwave radiation is not good for the human body. But in general, phones are totally safe unless there's something wrong with them. Um, so you're good, and 5G isn't an issue that we know of. Um, <laughs> treats and sketches are greater than only treats, Svartmaya says. And that is true. That is true. Um, let's see. Yeah, DPI beat me to the punch in the chat. James says, I do want to get back into more painting about space, so it may yet be a vital source of ideas. I'll definitely join the Discord. Thank you. It's always good to have other creative people around so that we can inspire each other. Um, oh, good. That's my Society6. I need to get more stuff up on Society6. Um, so take down rug. That is a completely unique username. Um, asks, what are your thoughts on the possibility of black holes existing in our solar system? There, there aren't any. No, we would know if there was a black hole in our solar system because we'd be able to see the impact of it on the orbits of other visible, visible objects if it was a stellar mass black hole. And if it was a microscopic black hole, those suckers evaporate so fast that it would have gone away by now. So we are black holeless in our solar system. Um, Michael is replying. Um, let's see what else is in here. There is a black hole at the center of our galaxy. That is true. And we're about two thirds of the way out, I think. They keep rearranging where we are in our galaxy. Um, so yeah. It's the absorption frequency of water is where 5G is. Thank you, DPI 209. Thank you. So it makes it hard to see clouds. Um, so James Knapper is commenting, um, I've always been fascinated with how small things like rocks look really similar to zoomed out images of the earth, for example. Yeah, that's... Um, a fractal effect and what's amazing is on worlds where you don't have weathering so the moon for instance rocks don't get weathered down and you don't have haze in the atmosphere to give you a sense of distance so a rock you can hold in your hand looks spatially identical to a rock far off in the distance that turns out to be the size of a house this is one of the things that we recently experienced while mapping out the asteroid Bennu um, as we got more and more zoomed in images from the spacecraft, they still looked absolutely identical because it's rocks all the way down of increasingly tiny sizes. So Stella is absolutely ridiculous at the moment. I just want to point out. Um, yeah. Bill Nash is in the house. Hello, Bill Nash. He, he is a photographer extraordinaire. Um, he puts beauty into the world. Okay, Larry says, on a journey to the Andromeda galaxy, is one likely to run into something? Sometimes dark, maybe. Um, so if you randomly put yourself on a straight line towards Andromeda and just 
head out without charting a course, there is a fairly good chance that you will along that path either go through a cloud of gas that will make the world completely dark, that you will end up, something will be along your path. Now, the likelihood of you hitting something solid like a star or a planet that are small is extraordinarily low. It's kind of like releasing a BB from the back of a theater. In all likelihood, if you just randomly release it, it won't actually hit anything. But if you start having people throw their jackets on the floor and stuff like that, and you put people in the seats, the more stuff you put in that's bigger than the legs on chairs, the more likely it is you'll hit something. So probably not going to hit a star, definitely will hit gas. Um, so Michael asks, have you come across the suggestion that Planet Nine might be a black hole? I've seen that. So for those of you not following along the work that Michael Brown of Caltech is doing, he's mathematically demonstrated that there is a high probability of there being a significantly sized planet in the outer solar system that is perturbing the orbits of dwarf planets like Sedna and Eris and some of the other ones that we see out there that all seem to have these strangely elongated orbits. A really good computer model visualization of this was done by Mark Subarau of the Adler Planetarium. And um, Michael Brown and his colleagues have been searching for this um, object. I just got a notification I'm trying to figure out. Um, have been searching for this object and so far haven't found it, but they're going to keep looking. Now, some folks have um, thrown out random ideas. Maybe it's a brown dwarf star. Well, a brown dwarf star we would have been able to see with the WISE mission. Um, and it would have moved during the lifetime of the WISE mission enough that we would have seen that movement. Now, there are models that say that our solar system could actually be a binary system with a brown dwarf, and we wouldn't have seen the brown dwarf move enough to know we're in a binary system. So that possibility is still out there. But if it was a brown dwarf close enough, thank you so much for the follow. Um, if it was a brown dwarf close enough to gravitationally do the things that Planet Nine does, well, first of all, it would have been doing them with a whole lot more oomph and things would have been flung much more wildly. Uh, and second of all, it would have moved enough that we could see it. If it was far enough away that we wouldn't notice its motion, it would be far enough away it wouldn't be flinging the minor planets around. Uh, other ideas that have been thrown out are random people have said loudly, black hole! And all the people who do orbital mechanics are like, no! Um, so, so... Cool ideas often are thrown out by people with no scientific background and take hold and spread across the internet. And that's one of the ones that has been thrown out by people with not enough science that sounds really cool. And so people want it to be true. And it is not. It is not true. All right. Continuing on. Um, could a black hole have consumed hypothetical planet nine? No, because then its gravitational influence would have gone away. And that black hole, which would have had to have been passing near our system, would have disrupted other orbits in other ways. Um, let's see what else is in here. Galaxy mapping from inside a galaxy is really, really difficult. I love all of the Bennu hate. Love the Bennu hate. Um... Looking to see what else is in here. Ooh, Bill Nash is going to be out chasing the Atlas Comet soon. Don't break any laws by going into national parks that are shut down. Please go someplace nice and isolated and dark and share your photos. Um, we're all kind of excited about, well, at least I can't speak for everyone else, but I am excited about Comet Atlas. Um... Larry says, um, 
It's saying 10% C, maybe a gas cloud will ruin your day. Oh, it will totally ruin your day. It will totally ruin your day. Uh, let's see what else. JWST was supposed to help looking for Planet Nine. Yes, but it's more of a confirmation instrument. So the JWST doesn't have that big of a field of view. You really need a survey telescope. So something at the scale size of a one meter to do a first pass of everything. And then you increase the size of your telescope and decrease the size of your field of view. The telescope most likely to find Planet Nine, if it hasn't already been found by then, is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is part of the Vera Rubin Observatory. Uh, that's the one that, as long as it can be seen from the Southern Hemisphere, and there's a chance it can't be, as long as it can be seen by the Southern Hemisphere, we're good. It will find it. Um, looking to see what else is in here. <laughs> Share photos. Is that even possible? Why? Yes. Why? Yes, Bill. It really is. Um, let's see. All right. Um, I think that's all we've got for today, or at least for the daily space for today. I will be back in less than an hour and a half with Astronomy Cast. And I swear to God, we're actually going to finally do an episode on white dwarf mergers. And if we don't, I will reach through the internet and smack Fraser with a fish. So today in an hour and a half, actually less than an hour and a half, in an hour and 20 minutes, be back right here. And we're going to talk about white dwarf mergers. Uh, me and Fraser Kane, as we record live before you, our internet audience. Um, so yeah, only with large trout, please. <laughs> you have no fish emotes, Bill? I don't think I have any fish emotes either. Um, yeah, I, I the COVID cast just happened. I don't quite know. Ha hmm. Haddock are for cutting down shrubbery. Properly use your haddock, sir. Properly use your haddock. Um, <laughs> checker Kev, that one is a little bit horrifying. <laughs> that one's a little bit more horrifying. All right, so other things going on. Um, tomorrow I am taking a no stream day. No streaming tomorrow. No streaming tomorrow. Um, yeah. Uh, Sunday I will be back. Um, I think I'm going to be doing Sunday Science Hour for Annie. I'm not sure. She and I need to coordinate. Um, she has recently moved here and does not have the mode. Not she doesn't have the router she needs to hook her computer up, and she's sick. And both of these reasons are on their own a reason not to stream. And to have both is just a bad day. So we're going to be taking care of, of things around here. There will be Astronomy Cast office hours on Sunday, and I am hoping to stream over on Star Strider uh, art of some sort. And I love the goldfish, J.B. McCool. I love the goldfish. All right. So let's see. If there's anything else around here that we need to pay attention to, um, I think we're mostly good. So as your standard reminder, I am your host for today, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I wrote today's episode of Astronomy Cast. Not Astronomy Cast. I wrote today's episode of The Daily Space. This episode will be produced by Susie Murph, and we are a product of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system and beyond. We're here thanks to you, your bits, your subs, your patronage at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. You make all the world in the difference. You make all the difference in the world and allow us to make this show possible. If you can't contribute financially, we totally get it. Everyone is struggling right now. But can you share us out? Can you tell your friends, tell your enemies? You never know whose life you're going to make better by introducing them to science. So thank you for being here. And I bid you adieu for now. But come back at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. That is 
math is hard. That is 7 p.m. London right now, I think. And we will be bringing you Astronomy Cast Live. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever in the world you may be.